Hello, everyone, and welcome on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences. I'm Claire Davison. I'm an engagement officer in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I will serve as your moderator today. Uh, so thank you all so much for joining us for uh, book, club, book Club. Today we will discuss Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, selected by Department of English Leaders and Faculty. So big thank you to Robin Warhol, College of Arts and Sciences Distinguished Professor in the Department of English, and Karen Winstead, Professor in the Department of English, for sharing their expertise with us today. Uh, so Robin and Karen will get started with some opening remarks about Jane Eyre, and then we will open up the conversation for all of your questions and comments. Robin, take it away. Thank you, Clara. And uh, I'd like to second Clara's thanks to all of you for attending today. Karen and I are very excited uh, to be talking about Jane Eyre. Um, you know, the way that we select the books for this series is by asking alumni in a poll, and we should be doing another poll soon, what's your favorite novel? And a lot of people named Jane Eyre. And I think that probably it would have been my answer if I were asked that question. It's between Jane Eyre and Pride and Prejudice for me. Um, I love Jane Eyre. I, because of the way I'm going to talk about Jane Eyre, I just need to emphasize this fact. I love it. I love Jane Eyre as a person. I love her like a member of my family. I've been reading Jane Eyre for almost as long as I can read. I remember when I was about 10 or 11 years old, my mother was reading Jane Eyre. Uh, she was kind of working her way through the English classics and it was lying around the house and I would pick it up and I would obsessively read over and over those first 50 pages about Jane's childhood. Oh, the injustice of the Reed household. Oh, the horrors of Lowood school. Oh, it was just so not fair and Jane so didn't deserve it and she was so great. And then I would get to the part where she becomes a teacher and I'd start over again at the beginning. I loved it. Uh, and, and I, you know, all through my career, um, it's been one of my very favorite books to teach. Um, I do want to talk today, though, about um, the ambivalence that feminist critics have always had about Jane Eyre. Uh, it's a book that makes, has made feminist critics uncomfortable almost as long as there have been feminist critics. And I want to talk just a little bit about why that is. Um, I'm going to call it an ambivalent relationship. I started out thinking of calling it a love-hate relationship, but I don't think anybody hates Jane Eyre. Uh, I think that um, it's really uh, ambivalence. Um, of course, when Jane Eyre was published in 1847, it was a huge success. It was a bestseller. Um, and uh, it was, of course, published anonymously. Charlotte Brenta called herself Currer Bell. She and her sisters not wanting to be dismissed as woman authoresses. Uh, used kind of gender ambiguous names. And everybody in, in London wanted to know who Currer Bell was. Who was it that had written this fantastic, phenomenal thing uh, that nobody had ever seen anything like before? Um, it's, um, it's always been a popular book, not always been respected as major literature, as 19th century women novelists, all except for George Eliot, tended to be dismissed. Uh, by serious critics of English literature through most of the 20th century. Uh, but certainly, once we started focusing more on women writers and on the achievements of women writers, Charlotte Bronte, Emily Bronte, Jane Austen, and George Eliot all shot to the top of the list of novelists in the Victorian period, or 19th century rather, with Jane Austen too, who must be studied. Um, I would like to say that feminist fans of Victorian fiction, whether they're novels by men or by women, we always read with what I think of as a kind of double vision. Um, we love the story, we love the heroine, we love the romance. The novel pulls us in, just as it would anybody um, who's, a, who's a fan of this kind of fiction. But at the same time, the feminist has to kind of recoil at the gender politics and the worldview that comes across in, in Victorian novels. And Jane Eyre is one of those novels where the gender politics and the worldview are just enough under the surface that it hasn't been obvious uh, why it makes feminists so uncomfortable. So that's what I want to talk about a little bit now. Um, the first feminist literary critic in the British tradition is Virginia Woolf. And uh, I've just been reading A Room of One's Own with my survey class. And I'd say if you've never read it, um, it is really a joy to read. Uh, it's you know this long meandering essay trying to answer the question, why are there so few great women authors? 
but specifically so few great women novelists, because she says women have never had time to write serious poetry uh, in the history of, of uh, English literature. But she's, she grants that Jane Austen, Emily and Charlotte Bronte, and George Eliot are geniuses. And she thinks that Jane Austen is pretty much perfect. Virginia Woolf doesn't have anything negative say about, to say about Jane. Um, but when she gets to talking about Charlotte Bronte, um, she's, she's praising her genius and her, her creativity, her originality, um, and, uh, and the passion in her book. But um, then she gets to a passage, which I'm going to read aloud, because it's a passage that for her is a kind of stumbling block uh, when she's reading Jane Eyre. The passage goes, Who blames me? Many, no doubt, and I shall be called discontented. I could not help it. The restlessness was in my nature. It agitated me to pain sometimes. And then an ellipsis. This is still Jane. It is vain to say human beings ought to be satisfied with tranquility. They must have action and they will make it if they cannot find it. Millions are condemned to a stiller doom than mine and millions are in silent revolt against their lot. Nobody knows how many rebellious, for how many rebellions, excuse me, ferment in the masses of life which people earth. Women are supposed to be very calm generally, but women feel just as men feel. They need exercise for their faculties and a field for their efforts as much as their brothers do. They suffer from too rigid a restraint, too absolute a stagnation, precisely as men would suffer. And it is narrow-minded in their more privileged fellow creatures, i.e. men, to say that they ought to confine themselves to making puddings and knitting stockings, to playing on the piano and embroidering bags. It's thoughtless to condemn them or laugh at them if they seek to do more or learn more than custom has pronounced necessary for their sex. Jane says, when thus alone, I not unfrequently heard Grace Poole's laugh. Uh, and then if you'll just um, uh, do the animation there, uh, Clara, I, I put on this PowerPoint so that you could follow with me what it is that Virginia Woolf um, dislikes about that passage. It's obviously a clearly feminist passage. It's a feminist rant against the oppression of women in the middle of the 19th century in England. It makes Virginia Woolf comfortable, uncomfortable because of what it does as she sees it to Charlotte Bronte's art. So she says, that's an awkward break, I thought. It is upsetting to come upon Grace Poole all of a sudden. The continuity is disturbed. One might say, I continued, that the woman who wrote these pages had more genius in her than Jane Austen. But if one reads them over and over and marks that jerk in them, that indignation, one sees that she will never get her genius expressed whole and entire. She will write in a rage where she should write calmly. She'll write foolishly where she should write wisely. She'll write of herself where she should write of her characters. She's at war with her lot. How could she help but die young, cramped and thwarted? And Virginia Woolf doesn't blame any woman author for not having come up to Virginia Woolf's standard of, uh, of, of pure artistic genius because she sees that anger, that frustration, that poverty that women have had, that, um, that, that oppression that they've lived under as something that twists and distorts um, their writing. And, um, and, and it's, it's so interesting that it's this feminist passage that Virginia Woolf objects to since her own project is purely feminist. Um, but her own way of doing, uh, fem being a feminist author is not to express the rage um, but to try to get above it and beyond it to experience what she calls the androgynous mind when she's writing it, to try to put that across in her books. So this particular passage has been important to feminists and in each generation. Um, if Virginia Woolf is a first wave feminist, um, Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar, second wave feminists, wrote that really important book, The Mad Woman in the Attic, in 1979. And it was really one of the first major works of feminist criticism um, in, to appear in the United States and extremely influential um, on feminist critics and I think on critics of all kinds. Now Gilbert and Gubar um, have issues with that same passage. Uh, they say that whenever Jane hears Grace Poole laughing, of course what she's literally really hearing is Bertha Mason's laughing. And they say that what Bertha Mason does in this novel is sit, stand for or signify the rage that Jane feels and that Jane has to repress 
in her relationships with everyone. She didn't repress it in that passage where she's complaining, but of course she's alone when she does that. In her behavior, she always has to stay so contained to behave the way she learned to from Helen Burns and from, from Miss Temple in school, to be a lady and not to um, let her rage out. And to be in relationship with Mr. Rochester, she has to repress um, any kind of, of, um, of, of negative reaction she's having to him. Um, yeah, and Gilbert and Gubar say that for, for uh, Bronte and for all 19th century women writers, British and American pretty much, there's that mad woman in the attic figure that comes back again and again, really is the feminist resistance to the patriarchal marriage plot. And that, um, that when Jane hears that, that eerie laughter, um, she's, she's really experiencing a part of herself, the part of herself that doesn't want to be um, subordinated to a man. And, and they say, look at this so-called happy ending. You know, Jane and Rochester get married, that's great. But Rochester's disabled. Um, and they say that that's the novel uh, taking revenge on him for the mistreatment of Jane that he's been um, that he's been guilty of really throughout their relationship. And they point out that, you know, Jane and Rochester, of course, Thornfield Hall is burned down. So they end up at Ferndean, this other house that Mr. Rochester owns, that's so damp uh, and so far away from civilization that Rochester had considered it too unhealthy to have Bertha living there. This is the explanation for why Bertha lives in the attic. Uh, at Thornfield uh, is because Ferndean's too unhealthy and it's completely cut off from any kind of community. And Gilbert and Gubar say, you know, for a Victorian heroine, that's actually not such a happy ending. Jane Eyre says how happy she is, but the way that Bronte sets it up, um, it doesn't really, it doesn't really uh, satisfy um, what uh, a, a, a heroine's happy ending ought to be, which is reintegration with a community, not just isolation with her husband and her children uh, in a place that's too unhealthy for a, the mad woman to have lived. Um, so, you know, they're, um, they're working in a, a kind of a psychoanalytic mode. Uh, and that's something that's been very, um, I mean, the idea that, 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 that Bertha is a, like a projection of Jane's repression is, is kind of a psychoanalytic model. And um, that's something that's really carried over in feminist criticism of Jane Eyre. The, the, the third and last critic I want to talk about is Gayatri Spivak, a wonderful post-colonialist critic who um, really rocked my world when um, she published in 1985 an essay called Three Women's Texts and a Critique of Imperialism. The three women's texts are Jane Eyre, Frankenstein, and Jean Rhys's um, Wide Sargasso Sea. Um, which I'll say something about in a minute. Um, Spivak says that when she was a little kid living in India in a, a Brahmin family, well-educated, wealthy, she read Jane Eyre. Of course, her English was impeccable. Uh, and she loved it. She identified with Jane. She was with her all the way through all those experiences. She read it the way I read it. She loved it. She loved it. And then she got to the end and to the episode where um, Sinjin Rivers is trying to get Jane to go with him to India on his mission to um, Christianize the heathen in India. And Spivak says, and suddenly I thought, oh, that's me. <laughs> I'm not Jane, I'm the heathen. Um, and you know, suddenly realizing that she'd had to identify against her own subject position to love Jane Eyre the way that she had loved it. I think she probably has loved it all her life. Uh, the way she writes about it is so, um, so detailed, so textured. You can tell she's engaged really, really closely with it. But, um, but she has found it to be um, um, a great example of how imperialism works itself out in the, the great English novels. Well, Spivak's argument is a little complicated, but she, she says that for Jane to triumph, Jane to become the the strong liberal individual self that she becomes in this novel in the course of this building's roman. Um, Jane can't exist as a self without having Bertha as an other. Um, Bertha, Jane refers to Bertha when she first sees her in the attic when Bertha's snarling and snatching around in that dark room as it. And even when she realizes that's a person, she still says it. 
And, and Spivak points out that Jane has to have this, this other, this woman of color, this, this, this mad woman, um, this person who isn't Jane for Jane to be consolidated as Jane. Uh, and, you know, I see her point. Um, there have to be heathen for there to be Christians. There has to be an India for there to be a, an England and a British empire. There has to be a Bertha for there to be a Jane. Um, Spivak says that Jean Reese really got it right in Wide Sargasso Sea, which if you haven't read it in your Jane Eyre fan, you've got to read it. It kind of changes your way of reading Jane Eyre forever because what Jean Reese did is to um, make Bertha Mason a heroine go back to the West Indies where Bertha Mason is from, show her childhood, show her growing up, show her being forced into an arranged marriage with this man who comes from England named Mr. Rochester, and then accounts for how she ends up in the kind of condition she's in um, when she's isolated from her home, her family, from everything she's ever known, and with this very uh, unsympathetic British man, um, why she goes crazy. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful novel. It even has a section that's told from Rochester's point of view. It's like Reese is really trying to understand the whole world around Jane Eyre and not just Jane herself that we focus on so much when we're reading and, and loving this book. All right, next we'll hear from Karen. All right, I am going to um, probably compliment Robin's talk rather well, because Robin talked about the ambivalence of uh, feminist critics toward Jane Eyre, and I'm going to really exemplify that with my reading. Um, I teach Jane Eyre primarily in the context, well, I don't teach the whole novel, but Jane Eyre comes into my teaching primarily in the context of my vampire literature course. And um, one of the very, very important uh, developments in the vampiric tradition is the development of the Byronic hero or the Byronic vampire as we study it. And that figure comes into being in 1819 with John Polidori's um, The Vampire. And the antagonist, the vampire of that story, is a guy by the name of Lord Riven, a, 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 um, a polished gentleman who woos his victim, the sister of the protagonist, by convincing her that he has only eyes for her. She's special. His life is worth living because there's she is in the world. And so he insinuates himself into her affection and she agrees to marry him. And on their wedding night, he sucks her dry because that's all he cares about is her blood and everything else is just an act. This suave, um, charming, seductive vampire modeled on the poet Lord Byron, the poet that John Polidori at the time was physician for, and um, whose ex called him mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Bad, mad, bad, and dangerous to know is the um, is is the definition basically of the Byron vampire exemplified by Lord Riven in Polidori's The Vampire. Now, Jane Eyre comes into it, it introducing a really, really important shift in the idea of the Byronic hero of which the Byronic vampire is one instantiation. And in Jane Eyre created a hero in the person of Mr. Rochester, who is bad, mad, dangerous to know. He's melancholy, brooding, cruel, possessed of a deep, dark secret. And yet he can be humanized. He can be tamed by the love of a good woman, as Jane does Mr. Rochester through her love, her faith, and her marriage to him. And now this figure replaced the Byronic vampire Lord Riven in subsequent 
vampire traditions. And Edward Cullen is a perfect example, right? I mean, he is dangerous, bad, mad, and Bella Swan transforms him into a worthy husband, just as Jane supposedly transforms Rochester. Okay, so, but I wanna bring in and move this Byronic vampire back to Jane Eyre by bringing in a more current work of vampire literature. And this is The Lost Girls by Sonia Hartel. And this is hot off the press. I mean, like a few weeks ago. And in this book, our heroine, Holly Liddell, uh, meets it as a high schooler, her to-be boyfriend, when she is engrossed in Jane Eyre and she meets the new boy, comes over, introduces himself to her. Um, he convinces her that she is the only person in the world for him. Let's see, what is, how is it said? Um, he'd been alone. Um, he didn't believe in love until he met her, blah, 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 blah. So she fell for him. She became a vampire, let him transform her. And then when he got tired of her, he ditched her at a truck stop and moved on to the next woman, feeding her the same lines. And she ended up as a 16 year old, um, uh, selling fast food at Taco Bell. Okay. She admits that she never actually read Jane Eyre. Instead, in the pages of Jane Eyre, she tucked Sweet Valley High. Now, what if she had read Jane Eyre? Would she have been better equipped to deal with the toxic vampire who romanced her? Literature, books like Jane Eyre, you know, you don't, learn about them, you learn with them. And part of their power is that they can make you think about your own situation more clearly, that you can acquire wisdom, that you can acquire clarity, that you can interact with them. And that's the joy of reading, that's the joy of the study of literature, at least um, for me and I think for many of you. So what do we get? from Jane Eyre in the realm of toxic relationships. We get a lot, of course. Jane Eyre is a case study of two profoundly abusive relationships. There is the obviously deeply abusive relationship of Jane and St. John uh, Rivers, the man that Jane nearly marries, and even though she has too much good sense to marry him, is willing to go off to India with him, even though she knows that it will shorten her life. So he has, he exercises this profound power over her. And it's, we can see him very, very clearly. We can see his abusive tactics, his manipulation of her, his abuse of her, because she can see it. And um, so that's less interesting. Far more interesting is Mr. Rochester, the first abusive relationship in Jane Eyre. Mr. Rochester is a textbook abuser. And what is brilliant about the way Jane Eyre or Charlotte Bronte writes this novel is that we can see at once his abusive tactics and Jane's growing involvement with him. It's that double vision that Robin talked about where we can feel as Jane feels, we can become sucked into her infatuation with Mr. Rochester. And yet, Charlotte Bronte has written this romance in a way that we can see everything he is doing to her. We can see the cruelty with which he plays with her. He pulls his rank on her. He lets her believe that he's in love with um, 
with Miss Ingram and indeed going to marry Miss Ingram, we see that he um, lies to her, um, that he keeps important information from her, even though he rides at the memory of important information having been kept um, from him and styles himself the victim of Bertha, um, his first wife and her family. We can see that um, he treats her and he speaks of her uh, as a pet, as Ms. Mrs. Fairfax says, he calls her a little bird. He calls her his witch, same term he used with Bertha. He calls her his pixie. He fantasizes about going off with her to Mars and living alone with her there, uh, isolated from everybody else. Um, he doesn't want to share her with anybody not with Adele, not with anybody. And when Jane resists him, he gets grumpy and, um, and so on. He wants her to be, he wants himself to be her world. And when she doesn't fall in line, he gives her grimaces, pun pinches, severe tweaks at the ear. He makes her uncomfortable and doesn't listen when she asks him to back off. He gives her gifts that she doesn't want, dresses her up, she says, like a doll. The more he bought me, the more my cheeks burned at a sense of annoyance and degradation. Jane, even as she falls in love with him, knows that she is in danger of becoming just another one in his sequence of kept women, starting with Bertha, whom he keeps in his manner, Celine, Adele's mother, Giancetta and Clara, four of them, and she knows that she could very, very well be his fifth. How will he feel about her, she asks him, in a year and a half, when the charm and novelty has worn off. In the end, he gaslights her, making her believe that the vision she saw of Bertha is, not, is just a delusion of an overwrought imagination. And when she tries to pull away, he tries to force her to embrace him. She's not sure, I think, ever that she wants to marry this man and speaks of going to her wedding with grim resolution. He tries to keep her from running away and she fears that he's going to hurt her if she isn't very, very careful. We see that even as we see her love for him. And I think it's difficult, really almost impossible to think that her ending up with this man is any kind of a happy ending. And I think it only can be a happy ending because the Rivers episode has convinced us that Jane can do so much worse. And because tragedy, a maiming, the repentance of Rochester, and the inheritance of Jane, really kind of deus ex machina mechanisms, have made him a suitable husband for her. Whereas if she had married him, after, you know, before when they had when they had originally planned to marry, you can't see this as turning out right. Jane says that she is happily married, that she has been happily married to Edward for 10 years. That's a long time. And of course, we have to believe her. And yet, Bronte has planted the rebellious streak, it, moment, it, 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 
being in our mind, that bit of Jane, the Jane who was the re rebel in those chap early chapters that Robin loved to read, Bronte has planted the suspicion that, well, okay, she is happy. She could have done worse, but mightn't she have done better? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, our first question uh, was submitted by Stephen. What do we make of the glowing report of the noble calling and destiny of St. John? Well, it's, a, it's always an important question because the novel ends with him. Um, why does Bronte choose to have Jane give him, as it were, the last word? And this, you know, this beautiful tribute uh, at the end to, you know, how nobly he died uh, and, and this, this important sacrifice that he's made. It's a very difficult thing to understand. I mean, on the one hand, Charlotte Bronte was a sincere Christian, uh, and it's the novel doesn't seem very Christian uh, in its in its ideology really at any moment. Um, but that uh, that kind of gesture towards a, a more conventional religion at the end, you know, it could be sincere on Bronte's part. It could be a kind of um, uh, she's trying in some way to make up for. Uh, all that is outrageous and rebellious in the novel uh, by ending it there. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that Jane does sincerely uh, respect St. John because he's so serious about his own convictions and she respects his willingness to die for that. Um, but, um, you know, as, as Karen said, it's so, he, he is so abusive to her that her having to make that gesture at the end of making him in some sense heroic after all, or tragic hero after all at the end, um, it, kind of, it kind of undercuts, I think, Karen, her, her awareness of um, what a monster he was in his relationship with her. Yeah. I mean, I love the way you describe both those relationships. You made me laugh out loud a couple of times, but what do you think yeah. about that, that um, glorification of St. John? Yeah, because she is, she's seduced by him. She's about to go out with him. And I think the brilliance of Bronte is her ability to convey how a woman who is independent and admirable and self-respecting could nonetheless be prey to different degrees of men like this in those two different ways. But one of the things in this latest um, read and my latest reading of Jane Eyre that really struck me over the head were the parallels between St. John and um, between St. John and and his devotion to um, his master God and Jane and her devotion to her master Rochester and she refers to him as my master over and yeah, over and over even in the end of the, that chapter when he is not her master and she's and she's he's not Edward he's my master and that final paragraph it's my master he says mm -hmm. and so St. John and Jane have both made that ultimate sacrifice of service and, you know, and there is definitely a religious quality in Jane's reverence for Rochester. So I would say that's where I would see the, 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 that going. Oh, well, that's brilliant. I love that. Our next question from Susan. Uh, Robin, you mentioned that Pride and Prejudice is a contender for your favorite novel. What do you see as differentiating factors between the two novels and the two novelists? Oh, they're, they're so different in every way. I mean, from Virginia Woolf's um, observation that Jane Austen created the perfect sentence, the perfect woman's sentence, uh, and, um, you know, that she, she looked at the, the male sentence of the 18th century, laughed at it, and crafted something of her own that um, is just a, a, a beauty, a thing of beauty and a joy forever. I love the way Jane Austen writes um, uh, the, the, the wit and the, um, the, the, the periodic sentences where she puts off the point or the punchline to the end uh, of each sentence. I just love it. I love that. I love the um, I love the wit in the um, interactions between the characters. I think you know when Jane when Jane Eyre and Rochester are sparring, I don't find it that funny. Um, it seems like Jane's amused by it. <laughs> but, I mean Jane Eyre, but I, I'm not really. Uh, I I love the way the characters speak to each other in Pride and Prejudice, and I I like the. Um, I mean to me, it's the more unambiguously feminist story 
um, in that, uh, you know, Jane Austen would have been reading Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Wollstonecraft argues that the problem, one of the worst problems with, with England is that upper class men are spoiled brats and they think too much about themselves and they don't look around at the, at the world and they're not responsible in the way that they should be. And, uh, and, and by the way, you know, women, um, women are only subordinated to them when in fact they could, you know, uh, provide so much in, in enriching and improving their lives and their characters. And Jane Austen writes Elizabeth and Darcy as if she's saying to Mary Wollstonecraft, well, look, this is how that would look if one of these spoiled uh, aristocratic men met a woman who really was his match um, and, and, and he could then be improved by her in a, in a way that to me is really believable. I love the scene at the end when he says, oh, and when she says, for what, which of all my many terrible characteristics did you love me the most? Um, this is after they're married. And, um, and, he, and he says, oh, you know, I loved everything about you, but, you know, the best thing about you was the way that you made me a better person. And he says, dearest, loveliest Elizabeth, it gives me a shiver just to think about that line. So it's, he's so, it's so heartfelt. He says, you know, I was, I was so spoiled in my, my parents made me think that I ruled the world and, you know, you were the one who made me see, um, you know, and, and you made me better. And I just love that. I love that. To me, that's the, um, it's the, the, the most power a woman could have in the early 19th century uh, in a realistic setting would be uh, to be able really to transform a man into a better person. I don't know if it ever really happened or if it ever happens now, probably not. Um, but to me, it's a it's a much better model of, of what a romance might look like than um, than Jane and Rochester is. Could I oh, add? Yeah, I, could, yeah. could I also wanted to ask Robin and anybody else who uh, who's interested in Jane uh, Jane Eyre and um, Pride and Prejudice? But as I was reading at this time, and um, and Jane got to Thornfield Hall, and he, she was interviewing. Um, I, I think the old butler of the previous, the servant who'd been in, in the family for a long time. And he tells- oh, you mean at the very end? At the very, very, yeah. at the very, very end. And he tells her about the fire. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And tells him about the fire. And it just struck me that that scene is so very much like um, Elizabeth Bennett's visit to Pemberley, where you she meets with an old servant mm -hmm. who gives- a completely different picture of this man and basically narrates him into somebody who is worthy of love. And that's what this butler does too, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I should have said the other thing I love about Pride and Prejudice is that Elizabeth herself transforms too, right? There's that scene where she's like, hey, wait a minute, maybe I was wrong. I love that. And it's like, I could have been wrong. And then when she reads the letter that Mr. Darcy writes to her and she recognizes how dreadfully wrong she has been and she's so ashamed of herself and you know she doesn't go into a depression or you know or, or, or kill herself or you know anything she takes it on and she becomes a better adult you know and and so it's it's the way that that's so beautifully balanced in Pride and Prejudice that I love it so much I, I just want to say one other quick thing I don't know if I'll get another chance to share this anecdote I shared with Clara and Karen the other day but when I was teaching a freshman seminar, this was maybe 20 years ago, it was called The Marriage Plot, Then and Now, and I was following marriage plot stories from Pride and Prejudice all the way up to, you know, contemporary rom-coms and sitcoms and things like that, and um, we were reading Jane Eyre, and I was asking my students, um, when, who, by the way, there were about 20 of them, and they were all first year students, so 18 years old or so, and they were all women, no, no men signed up for this class, not surprisingly. Um, and I asked them, so how is this novel going to end up? And they said, oh, Jane's going to marry Rochester. And I said, okay, how do you know that? We're only a, about a third of the way through the novel. They said, because um, he loves her. And I said, well, how do you know that? And they said, because he's so mean to her. <laughs> I said to them, oh, oh, <laughs> you know, you're right. In a novel, that is what it means. When he's mean to her, that means he loves her and that means they're gonna be live happily ever after. But girls, in true real life, that's not true. If a man is mean to you, it does not mean that he loves you. And it was so interesting because it's like their eyes started spinning around in their heads like, 
they hadn't really thought about that. And so I was interested in what Karen said, the question you raised, if that vampire girl had read Jane Eyre, would she have been any wiser? Maybe not, you know, maybe not. Maybe Jane Eyre also would have taught her that to be abused is to be loved. And that's the sign of true love as so much of, of, of English literature has told us. I think, yeah, I mean, things can be read in so many different ways, depending on where you are and what you're bringing to them. And, you know, I uh, don't think I ever saw the profoundly abusive strains in Jane Eyre when I read it, maybe the first time and the second time when I was younger. And I could very easily see somebody um, getting through Jane Eyre and taking away from it. And that's why I'm very ambivalent about it, taking away from it, the idea that, well, if I'm good enough and I yeah. stay with this guy, I can do it too. Yeah. I can be Jane Eyre. Yeah. And that's that's frightening and horrible. Yeah. Um, whereas now when I read it, and I'm 61, I, I, I read it and I say, run, woman, run! <laughs> But it's you never good, say that to Elizabeth Bennett. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a it's a good it's a great book to think with. It really, really is to think with, to learn with, um, because it's it's so rich. So Karen, a question from Susan here: um, How is the Byronic mad, bad, dangerous to know antihero compare uh, with the traditional by then Don Juan figure? I would say it's very it, it's very similar. Um, I wouldn't draw a strong, dis well, I don't know, maybe I should draw a strong, a strong distinction, but, um, the love them and leave them, leave them, the seduce them and go on to the next person. I mean, that's very much the mad, bad, dangerous paradigm. And that's something that I think, you know, Byron drew upon and exploited. I think the two paradigms are extremely closely related for me anyhow. Uh, and what, a question from Nicole, uh, what would the Me Too movement think of Rochester and of Jane today? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, yes, absolutely. And in, in fact, are, it, can we ever read Jane Eyre the same in the wake of Me Too? I mean, just so many of the things that women came forward and said happened to them, happened to Jane, you know? It is, you can just tick them off. Yeah, um, and would Jane actually do that hashtag? In my fantasies, yes. Well, it, it is literally workplace harassment, right? Mm -hmm. And what that makes me think about is how limited, and this is Virginia Woolf again, how limited women's opportunities were in Charlotte Bronte's time, right? Charlotte Bronte uh, and Emily Bronte and Anne Bronte all trained to be governesses. Their dream was to own a school and to have students come to them and to teach them independent of any master being over them or any, um, any you know, uh, mother and father supervising their teaching of children. That's what they wanted, but they never could get the money together to do it. And so they, they tried governessing, you know, in, um, in, in to different degrees. Uh, Anne did more of it than Charlotte or Emily. Emily couldn't, she just couldn't. She couldn't live outside of her home. Uh, she, she was way too um, uh, nonconformist uh, to do it. Uh, Anne did it for years and uh, and if you read Agnes Gray, her first novel, you see what a misery it was to be a governess, really, to be at, at the beck and call of um, people who were not even her educational equals um, and, and who in fact were from a, a social class perhaps lower than the one she was born into. She just happened to be impoverished uh, and then to have to work as uh, as their inferior. I mean, it's, it's when you think about the Jane's choices, right? She doesn't want to stay at the school because it's the whole world she's ever known. She wants to see the world. So she ventures out and then the world turns into be this, you know, this, this gothic, this big gothic house, right? That's got its secrets and its and its abuse and 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 that becomes the world to her. And she doesn't have any other options. Um, and you know, the Me Too movement, it, it's it's uh it's, it's wonderful, right, to have gotten all these women's stories out there and to realize there is no profession you can go into where you're not going to be harassed. 
um, or at least that's been the case up until this time, right? We hope that someday it won't always be like that. Um, but at the same time, it just makes me so grateful when I think about Jane Eyre, when I think about the Brontes, um, that we have so much more uh, choice, so many more options now. Um, she's so truly stuck in that situation. I don't think she could afford to use that hashtag uh, and to, to admit to herself, right, that um, this is all she can do. And yet when she has the means and the money and the wealth and she, she goes back into it, it, she goes back into it and right, she could in live with the old house. She could live with Diana and Mary forever and it would be wonderful, right? Her cousins that she loves and who are really good to her. She can um, meet a nice man. There were nice men, sure. right? I mean, it, it was- Not in that awesome. world. No, not well, in the not world in that the Brontes yet. imagine. No, there aren't any nice men. The, not that the we heroes in all their novels are awful. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> So a question from Elaine, uh, do you think the novel Rebecca echoes any of this? The man is abusive, always telling the heroine she's stupid, clumsy, and hiding oh, yeah. the truth of Rebecca, and at the end the house burns down and he's rather broken. Oh, absolutely. I really think Du Maurier is rewriting Jane Eyre. I really do. I love Rebecca. I love the movie. I love the novel. Um, I just think it's, a, it's an adaptation, really, of Jane Eyre, updating it. And, um, you know, his, the secret is a little different, but it's the same secret. It's there was a bad first wife, right? Um, and he's not going to tell her the truth about it. And so she's going to suffer from that. It's mm -hmm. so, so close. Uh, yeah, I, I really think that Dumarie is quite, quite um, consciously rewriting Jane Eyre. And then from Sabra, isn't the flip side of this argument sort of then and now that the woman is the only one with the power to change and tame the man in one way or another and make him better and no longer mad and bad? It's the flip side of what? It's a good question. Sabra, if you want to clarify, um, <laughs> that might be helpful. Um, but in the meantime, a comment from Susan. I have a hard time seeing why Jane is attracted to Mr. Rochester. He has money, but he is not fun to be with. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, it, you could you could go um, 21st century psychological on her there and say that uh, she's she's the the type of the woman who loves too much, the woman who's used to abuse, right? I mean, this is the thing about those early chapters of Jane Eyre is that she's she's as a child she's been neglected, she's been abused, she's she's been hurt everywhere where she should find love, what she finds instead is pain. And so what the, the women who love too much, like this is just pop psychology, right? But the, the pattern of the abused woman who then goes on and, and marries an abusive man and then sticks with him no matter what, is the idea that when you have that warped childhood of abuse, you think that's what love feels like. You think that, that's, that that pain is what love is. And uh, and to me, you know, Jane Eyre is almost like a like a a, a model illustration that relationship with um, the relationship with Rochester, but also the fact that she that she even does consider being with St. John too. That she feels a lot of pain in that relationship too, and that's to her that's what love is because she's never known anything else. Yeah, uh, and and we see it. One of the things that makes this just so compelling is that we see these relationships in real life all the time, and Bronte has captured that, and it hasn't ended, and it's not a phenomenon of the nineteenth century. That's right. And I think that all of us probably could think of instances, no people, no women who are too good for these relationships. And they are Mr. Rochester, you know, uh, clones, basically updated a little. And yet these women are drawn to them. And it's profoundly sad. Yeah, I mean, you could say that every battered woman who goes back uh, to her abuser um, is is that same exact syndrome. And you're right, Karen, it's, it's as much with us now as it ever was. You know, people think that the Brontes, you know, they lived out in that parsonage, you know, up in Haworth with no one around and they, they only knew each other and they, you know, they, their world was small. It's not true, it's really not true. They were very engaged with their community. They knew a lot of people. They, they observed relationships very closely. Um, and, you know, they're not writing about themselves. These are not their experiences, um, but their insight. I'm thinking here about Emily as much as, as, as Charlotte. Their insight is it's, it's miraculous um, into what other people's relationships are like. 
And it's so easy to think, oh, well, that, or to, to say, well, she was writing when women were not respected back in the 19th century and it's different now, but it's just so surprising the way it isn't different now. Oh, this is the point of my marriage plot class. I mean, I keep telling my students, we still live in the Victorian era as far as gender relations are concerned. And that shocks them because they're like, wait, what, you know, we're, we're women, but we can wear blue jeans and, you know, we can, we can enter any profession we want. And actually, if you get down below those surface, surface elements of kind of, uh, of style and, and uh, everyday life, and you get down to the kind of deeper structures of gender relationships, they're the same as they ever were in, um, in the Victorian period. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why. I don't know if it's because the Victorian period taught us how to think about gender and we're stuck there. Um, I don't know why we haven't made more progress. I can trace it back to the medieval period. Yeah, I guess you could, Karen. <laughs> it's Western culture, thank you. <laughs> a comment here from Susan. I'm a student of Spanish Baroque theater and novel, the avenging woman who seeks to restore her reputation is a stereotype there. Uh, me too, but with a solution. Um, I think that Jane Eyre is different and that she says she's not the noble, beautiful heroine who by rights deserves to be heard. Uh, Jane Eyre seems to be the democratization of the rights of women. Excellent, excellent point. It's true. Uh, it's very important that Jane Eyre is plain. Um, that uh, there, I don't think there's a, uh, there's a heroine, I'm trying to think back through the 18th century. I don't think there's a heroine in a British novel before Jane Eyre, a, a, a British novel that has survived you know, uh, in our, in our um, literary history who's plain, right? They're, they're always beautiful and that their beauty is their power. Um, I remember once hearing Gloria Steinem say, this was a long time ago, she was giving a, a lecture in like 1983, I was there and somebody asked her, why are so few college women feminists? And she said, because college women are at their age where they're actually at their peak of power. Uh, and that peak of power comes with their physical attractiveness, which is at its peak when they're 18 years old. And so they haven't experienced yet the problem of women's lack of power. But as they age, they will see. <laughs> you know, it's, um, yeah. All right. And from Catherine, did Rochester evolve and change in the end, or did he continue as an abusive person? That's impossible to know. I don't believe in, um, in, in like guessing or fantasizing about things that aren't in the text. To me, they're not real people. They're, they're miraculous creations of words, but we only have the words that are there. Um, so, you know, for me, interpretation is all about understanding what the author gave us, mm -hmm. um, but I don't try to go where the author doesn't go. I think, I, I I think the, the evidence is really ambiguous. He says he changed and Jane says that she's been happy with him for 10 years and that's compelling. You know, that there's no <laughs> particular reason for to believe him or to believe her. On the other hand, when they meet, he is going back to the telling her that, well, you know, she should never have run away and he would have, he would never have hurt her even though that belies what um, Bronte has narrated about that scene where she tries to go away and he tries to forcibly restrain her. And then, um, you know, um, yeah, he says, I'm not like that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't need to be jealous. And he's up to some of his old tricks, I think, when you read, <laughs> read that passage. So I don't think we know enough. We aren't given enough information and we can't speculate, as Robin says. But um, yeah, yeah. I, but she, I'm not... she likes that. She, she likes that, right? She's yeah. attracted to that. Mm -hmm. um, and if he were to become totally tamed, mm -hmm. he wouldn't be what she loves because of this, you know, this emotional history of hers. Right, right. And he is checked. He can't do as much damage as he can't as he once could do, since he is um, blind and unable to, to you know, ride off into the distance and leave her. Yeah, he he can't leave her at a truck stop and 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 no, uh, and, exactly and resume not. working at a Taco Bell. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Well, we're drawing to the close of our hour. Thank you all so much for all your questions. I'm sorry we weren't able uh, to get to all of them, but 
Karen and Robin, any parting thoughts about why Jane Eyre continues to endure? I mean, there's there's a way in which Jane Eyre is the it's the blueprint for all the romances that come after it, right? For um, for all the uh, dime store romances and for all the rom coms and all the um, um, Rick, all the love stories, right? It's the blueprint. Uh, and why it became the blueprint, I can't really explain, except that it is a work of genius, as, as even Virginia Woolf admits. Uh, and it's so vivid, it feels so real uh, when you're reading it, that it seems like this must be true. This must be what, what love, what romance is. And it's like, it has just persisted um, as the model of that. And we see it over and over and over again, the story of you know, oh, they 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 spar, they're mean to each other, they hate each other, then they then they love each other. That's what love is. Um, I don't think that that is, as I said to my students, I don't think that's the way it is or should be in real life. You know, um, but I do think that that's what fiction tells us it is, and uh, and it starts in Jane Eyre. And I think also another thing that may contribute to its longevity is that it it opens itself to diametrically different interpretations, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so it allows you to read it in, in multiple ways and talk about it and think, think with it. It's a great novel to think with. Wonderful. Well, a big virtual round of applause and, and thank you to Karen and Robin for sharing all your expertise and insights with us here today. Thank you for this opportunity. It was so much fun. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yes.